All right, hello everyone, and welcome to my channel. Uh, it's an educational channel. We take a look at great theories of everything, all-encompassing theories, grounding theories, theories that you can um, use to figure out anything. And um, usually they are theories from somebody that you've never heard of. And uh, today is our ninth video that we've done on Daniel Ingram and his book, Mastering the Core Teachings of the Buddha. Um, so Ingram was, is an um, American who spent a lot of time over in the Far East at mon in monasteries, learning everything that he could through, not only through meditation, but through instruction from the ancient wisdom of the Buddha that's been passed down um, by word of mouth and um, by texts throughout the millennia and brought it back to the states and put it into language that we can understand easily. It is a complete work. He tries to talk about everything that he feels is important. And um, I think it's a pretty important book. And um, especially given that it is uh, under, under known um, now, when Ingram talks about uh, Buddhism, he talks first about the three trainings. The training in morality, training in concentration, and training in insight. And um, the third training, training in insight, is about insight meditation, uh, which is a little bit different than concentration meditation, uh, which is the second training. First training in morality is just done on a day-to-day -day basis. The other two in uh, meditation. And uh, insight meditation, uh, while the concentration involves, uh, you know, focusing on one object for meditation, the insight meditation is more about opening up your six sense doors and just sitting there and noticing what happens to you and staying with the um, the, f the sense impressions and the mental impressions and staying out of the content entirely. And uh, Ingram instructs you to look for uh, the three characteristics in all phenomena and uh, these are impermanence, dissatisfactoriness, and not self or no self. So um, yesterday we covered pretty much all of the uh, impermanence section. And so now today we're getting to the dissatisfactoriness. And we're going to start right here. The next characteristic is dissatisfactoriness, misery or suffering. Various translators and scholars debate the best way to translate the Pali word dukkha, D-U-K-K-H-A, which is the word that I am rendering here as dissatisfactoriness. I will sometimes translate it as suffering and other ways. Other translators and authors also use terms such as misery, unsatisfactoriness, stress, and anxiety. I don't think that we really have a perfect English word that can capture its nuances, which is why there are various opinions about how we should translate it. Such discussions can become too academic for me as what I care 
most about is practice. And in practice, dukkha is right there in your immediate experience to be understood. There are two major aspects to the Buddha's teaching on dukkha. The first and most famous being the implications of having been born, which entails issues of having a body and the ordinary facts of physical pain, sickness, aging, and death, as well as interpersonal conflicts, personal losses, fears, sorrows, grief, lamentation, and the like. These unfortunate aspects of having been born are clearly of great significance throughout our brief lives. However, the second aspect of dukkha is the key for insight practices, and that is the inherent painful tension that comes because we take the sensate data coming in and misinterpret those sensations in a way that causes us to habitually create the illusion of a permanent, separate, independently functioning, a-causal, localized self. This mode of perceiving experience is more painful than the other way that sensate reality can be perceived, in which sensate data imply the exact reverse that there is naturally occurring, causal, self-perceiving, immediate transience, uh, uh, immediate transience. Insight practices can show us this other, less painful way of perceiving reality and eventually hardwire it into our systems so that we don't go back to the more painful way which involves the dukkha created by this misperception. Dukkha sounds grim or pessimistic, and perhaps deservedly so in a sense, but it is also a powerful statement that our moment-to-moment -moment separate self-experience cannot, does not, and will never provide lasting satisfaction. Why? One reason is that everything is momentary. Nothing lasts, meaning that you can experience everything that you normally think of as a solid world arising and passing instant by instant. So what could last for even the blink of an eye to satisfy? Nothing. The point is not to be a gloomy, pessimistic, or nihilistic cynic. This sort of attitude will not help on the insight front. What does help is an understanding of something in our relationship to all things. There is no thought, mind, state, or thing that provides lasting satisfaction. This is not to say that conventional day-to-day -day wisdom, such as taking care of ourselves and others, is not important. It very much is. Remember that awakening is not a thing or a mind state or a thought. It is an understanding of perspective without some separate entity that perceives. Honestly, about the truth of suffering is a relief. It's a relief not to pretend away uh, this shared and universal condition. It can validate the actual experience of our lives and give us the strength to look into the aspects of life we typically try to ignore, deny, and avoid. Even some deep and useful insights can be distinctly unpleasant, contrary to popular belief. There is more to this second characteristic, and it relates to the third characteristic of no self. We are caught up in this bizarre habit of assuming that there is a boss controller entity 
called I. Yet the definition of this seemingly permanent thing must keep constantly changing to maintain the illusion in an impermanent reality. This takes up a lot of mental time and energy and is continually frustrating to the mind as it takes so much constant work and effort. It is also mentally painful. This process is called ignorance. That is, the illusion of an I which assumes that everything else not conceived as such is not I. This is the illusion of duality. And the illusion of du duality is inherently painful. There is just something disconcerting about the way the mind must hold itself and the information it must work to ignore or deny to maintain the sense that there is a permanent and continuous self. Maintaining is painful and its consequences for reactive mind states are also painful. It is a subtle chronic pain like a vague nausea, like a mild headache. It is a distortion of perspective that we have grown so used to or embedded within that we hardly ever notice it. The suffering caused by continually trying to prop up the illusion of duality is fundamental suffering. This definition of suffering or dissatisfactoriness is the one that is most useful for insight practices. To detect this quality of reality moment to moment can be hard to do. Not because dissatisfactoriness is so hard to find. It has been said to be the easiest of the three characteristics um, to tune into. But because it takes a certain amount of courage and honesty, yet it is so well worth it if we finally wake up to this painful background reality, we will effortlessly let, us, let it go. Drop it like a hot coal that we have realized we were holding. It really works like that. And letting go in this way means being free of it. Investigate your experience and see if you can be open to that fundamental, story-free, drama-free aspect of your bare existence, your bare experience, that is unsettling, unpleasant, m miserable, or dissatisfactory. It can be found to some degree in every instant, regardless of whether that instant is pleasant, unpleasant, or neutral. A fact that many initially find surprising, but as practice goes on, becomes more and more obvious. Once you have some mental stability, you can even examine the bare experience of the sensations that make up the stories that spin in your mind and see how unsatisfactory and unsettling it is to try to pretend that uh, they are a self or the property of some imagined self. If we continue to habituate ourselves to this understanding moment to moment, we may get it into our thick heads and finally awaken. This interpretation of reality called ignorance then leads to the mind inclining towards pleasant sensations, attraction, away from negative ones, aversion, and negatively burning out in general, another meaning of the word ignorance. 
These three basic types of reactions are generally known as the chalasas. Okay. Uh, I think it says K-I-L-E-S-A-S. Uh, in Pali or Klishas in Sanskrit, K, uh, I think that's an L, K L E S H A S. Or somewhat dramatically, um, the three defilements, corruptions, or mental poisons. In terms of relative reality, they can manifest in various emotional flavors of greed, hatred, and delusion. More formally, and following the classification found in the um, uh, Abhidharma, we find 10 or 14 kalesas emphasized as being the most dangerous for us, with a more complete list being greed, wrong view, delusion, hatred, doubt, conceit, restlessness, sloth, worry, torpor, shamelessness, fearlessness of wrongdoing, envy, and avarice. This list bears a remarkable is a, a resemblance to the seven deadly sins listed by Pope Gregory I and later Dante as lust gluttony, avarice, sloth, wrath, envy, and pride. However, the more fundamental, non-story-based, and even non-emotion-based sensations of attraction, aversion, and ignorance can be found to some degree in every instant, regardless of whether that instant is overtly pleasant, unpleasant, or neutral and regardless of the presence or lack of the states of mind listed as defilements. My favorite exercise for examining dukkha is to sit quietly in a quiet place with eyes closed and examine the physical sensations that make up any sort of desire, be it desire to get something, attraction, or get away from something, aversion, or just check out or go to sleep ignorance. At a rate of 1 to 10 times per second, try to experience exactly how you know that you wish to do something other than simply face your current experience as it is. Moment to moment, try to discern every little uncomfortable shift, urge, impulse, and tension that prods your mind into fantasizing about the past or future or st stopping the meditation entirely. For that meditation period, they become my prey and nourishment. Opportunities to understand something extraordinary about reality, and so I do my very best to let none of them arise and pass without clearly perceiving and acknowledging the basic sense of dissatisfac uh, dissatisfaction in relation to them. So for that period, try to turn on sensations of the desire to get results. Turn on the pain and unsettling sensations that make the mind shrink reject or contract. Turn on the boredom that is usually aversion to suffering in disguise. Turn on the sensations of restlessness that try to get you to stop meditating and do something, anything else. Turn on anything with fear or judgment. Turn on any sensation that smacks of grandiosity or self-loathing. Turn on the things that typically derail meditation and make them into meditation objects. 
turn on the sensations related to thinking about your meditation, which is generally aversion or attraction disguised by intellectual analysis. While there is value in metacognitive awareness, there is also great value in investigating the sensations that make up metacognitive awareness. A half hour, sorry, here, just trying to look at the clock, a half hour to an hour of this sort of consistent investigation of dissatisfactoriness. It's also quite a workout, particularly as we spend most of our lives doing anything but looking at the sensations to gain insight from them. However, I found that this kind of investigation pays off in ways I could have never imagined. Later, I will explain a stage called the knowledges of suffering a.k.a. the dark night. If you find yourself having trouble with that phrase or practice, come back here and try this exercise as it can turn the tables on something that otherwise might turn the tables on you. Exploring dissatisfactoriness may not sound as concrete as the first characteristic of um, moment tariness or impermanence, but I assure you it is. Even the most pleasant sensations have a tinge of misery to them, not only because they end, but also due to the strange way we hold our minds to create a sense of a stable self in a changing world. So look for it at the level of base experience. Physical pain is a gold mine for this. I am absolutely not advocating cultivating or um, inducting pain as there is already enough there. Uh, just knowing in each instance, instant, how you know that pain is dissatisfactory and miserable can be profound practice. Don't settle for just the knee-jerk reaction. Of course pain is miserable. Know exactly how you know this to be true in each moment. And don't get lost in stories or interpretations about it. This is base reality we're talking about. Just be with it. Engage with it and know it at a very simple and straightforward sensate level. Okay, that is the end of that section on uh, dissatisfactoriness. Uh, we'll now move into the next section called No Self, which is the third characteristic. The last and perhaps most understood of the three characteristics is no self. The original Pali word uh, anatta means literally no self. This same term is also rendered by other authors in other ways, some of which can be extremely pr problematic, such as egolessness, a terribly problematic term, since ego as understood in the Western psychological sense, is not the referent of the conception of self targeted in, Buddha, in Buddhism. Another problematic rendering of this term is emptiness. Emptiness, for all its mysterious sounding connotations, means that reality is empty, empty of, devoid of, or lacking a permanent, separate, independent, acausal, autonomous self. It doesn't mean that reality is not there, but that reality is not there in the way it may appear to us to be. 
Solidity and permanence are mistaken perceptions. Uh, that the watcher, whatever seems to be observing things, also known as the perceiving subject, uh, is a thing separable and independent from what is perceived, is mistaken. However, all of this is not merely an illusion, though how the watcher is perceived and how sensate experience is interpreted initially is clearly delusional, as good practice eventually may reveal. Sure, all experience is utterly transient and ephemeral, but that is not quite the same as saying that everything is an illusion. There is a habit of reading just a bit too much into things and mistakenly concluding that all of this means that there is some separate, permanent me. Reality is fine just as it is and always has been, but there is a deeper understanding of it that is called for. Let's take a little bit Let's talk a little bit about this concept and how the illusion of a self is created in the first place. Before we talk about how to apply this powerful and profound concept of no self in simple ways for practice, some theory is indispensable for the practice as all of it can be understood directly once we have some stability of mind and some direct insight into what is mind and what is body. And when each is or is not, uh, and when each is or is not there. We have this notion that there really is a permanent autonomous I. We might say, hello, I am and be quite convinced that we are talking about a permanent separate thing that can be found. However, if we just use a bit more sophisticated, um, if we are just a bit more sophisticated, we might ask, what is this I, which I am sure is me? We have grown so habitu habituated to the fact that uh, the fact of its definition changing all the time that we hardly notice it. But the point of insight practice is to notice that and to see just what it is that we are calling I in each moment. Okay, I think we're going to stop right there. Um, actually, it looks like, uh, we got a couple more minutes. Okay. We may begin with the obvious assumption, I am my body. This sounds nice until I say something like my body. Suppose someone points to my toenails. Are they me? It might seem that way until I clip them and then parts of them being no longer there, are no longer me. Likewise, say you cut off your finger. If you are your body, you would cease to be if you cut your finger off. But this is not the case. So we cannot say that this I we fabricate is equivalent to the body. Is the body of the present moment the same as the body at the time of my birth? If it were, wouldn't we look the same now as we did then? It isn't even made up of the same dolls, I'm sorry, the same cells, and yet it seems to us to be a permanent thing. Look more closely at the sensate level and you will see that the body changes moment to moment 
at the level of actual experience, all that is found is flickering stuff. So momentariness or impermanence is closely related to no self, but there is more to no self than that. Okay, we're going to stop there. Uh, resume tomorrow at that spot. So thanks for tuning in today. I hope you come back tomorrow and have a great day.